And that was kind of a bridge between the previous segment talking about ISM, small businesses into the employment uh, numbers. I think it's important to appreciate, you know, what are small business firms, what are small firms saying? Or what, you know, where do they feel or where do they think they're going to be over the next, you know, six to 12 months? And here is, is a great kind of indication of where the problems lie. So you, about 25% have already returned back to business. You know, things are operating a little bit better, which is good to see. But again, it also adds to why there's been such weight on new employment. And we're, and you see this, this breakdown between larger firms, you know, seeing a, a bigger upturn and recovery while small businesses continue to struggle. The bigger problem is where do they see uh, business getting back to normal levels? And the answer was more than six months, which was 47% of people who uh, responded. So when we consider kind of where we are in 2020, as we look, you know, we're, we're starting September. And when we look out, this, this is where we start to get this pause about, you know, how quick can that recovery really be in 2021? given how uncertain the small business and the small firms, and it, this also leads to medium-sized firms, in terms of how are they really going to kind of get back to normal because there's a lot of uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty on the business level, that's capex, that's hiring, that's a lot of things that really kind of trickle down and move through the economy, which we we continue to to, to uh kind of shine a, a bright light on because this is something that we think is being missed in the market or not being appreciated in terms of, you know, how are the small firms really reacting? And that's, and that's really trickling into, okay, well, what, what are home-based worked hours? And you can see we're well off of where we were uh, back in uh, before COVID, but you can see that we're starting to kind of roll back over and we're starting to see some of those declines. And when we look at it from the perspective of employees working, you can see the business opening, uh, and and you you tie that back to the previous um, uh, the previous slide, and you think about okay, well, there's there's a certain amount of people that have come back to business in terms of you know the numbers showing that 25% are back, but 47% st- have no idea or are are more than six months between normalcy, and that's where we're seeing that that down 25% is a concerning number and you see starting to see those concerns because that fiscal stimulus has really run out and you're starting to see now it's like okay well I took a, a triple p loan I went to the small business agency and tried to got uh, try to get some help those are wearing off and if, and if those as those continue to wear off that's going to continue to weigh on some of this pressure which is why we look at you know the employment unemployment and then those PMI numbers, because manufacturing is showing something pretty good. You know, manufacturing is getting a little bit better. Construction is still a little bit slow. But again, you're starting to see that that movement back. But on a restaurant, on a hospitality, some of these key, you know, work hours, we're, we continue to see some of this pressure, which again, it's kind of that unbalanced recovery, which is going to uh, lead to a, a much smaller bounce and then, you know, leads into what's going to happen in 2021, which is something that we think is going to be a, a bigger headwind. And then when we consider the amount of jobs being added, you know, ADP employment data came in positive, 428,000, but again, missed expectations. So it missed expectations. We were expecting something a little bit larger, but it, it's still a positive benefit. We still saw some some increases. Now the next question is going to be what is happening on unemployment, which is going to come out uh, later tomorrow, you know, because just based on when the show is filmed. So that, those are things that we're going to look at and to uh, to appreciate in terms of where is unemployment versus where is new employment. And it's again the the pressure remains where there's just not enough new jobs coming back in terms of new employment to offset just the amount of people that have remain out of work furloughed and continue to have concerns. Because if you have a concern for your job, you're going to go out and actively look for a new one. But right now, it's just we're not seeing those uh, those numbers correlate, which is going to uh, put uh, additional pressure on just consumer spending. And this is where when we talk about you know those people who feel un- uncomfortable in their current position, this is U.S. workers worrying about being laid off from their job. And you can see the bigger increase as we've seen over the uh, uh, essentially 
again, this is why we like to talk about 2019 into 2020 is you're seeing those, those increases. Like this, this wasn't just a 2020 COVID story. It was a 2019 story, which is leading into a COVID story, which is going to only continue to get worse, which is why we think that there is going to, there's more pressure when you consider, okay, well, if things were starting to weaken in 2020, then Maybe some of the people that were furloughed or let go because of COVID, because the company could say, hey, sorry, COVID had to let you go. But maybe their jobs were already becoming secondary or becoming uh, ancillary. And this was just the excuse. And that's why we're, we're concerned about how quickly some of these, uh, these individuals can get jobs and how quickly they can get back into the market. Now, the CPI, core CPI, PCI <laughs> is... Is something that we're we can, we're going to continue to talk about because the question of inflation, no inflation, you know, what is the Fed doing? What is the weighting of the inflation number? I can tell you quite openly that my healthcare costs are the same as my mortgage, and if that isn't some form of inflation, I, I don't really know what is. And again, it, it comes down to that's my own personal anecdotal experience. It's really not the data side. So this is why we try to look at the data and say, okay, well, what is the data really saying? And here, the problem is the the inflation numbers that the Fed uses is using Medicare, Medicaid data, not really what is the other side of the equation looking for. And that's why we want to look at, okay, well, what is medical care year over year change? And you can see how things just exploded to uh, up and to the right. And even though core PCE has remained kind of, you know, lackluster, we continue to see some of these moves and the dollar remains obviously in, in, a, in, a, in a fairly stable uh, place given when we go back to 2012 until now. And the problem is just the inherent cost that we've seen on the medical side. So now let's pull a little bit further out and look, okay, well, let's look at CPI on all items and just where things sit overall. And you can see the weightings and, and how they really aggregate in. Now, apparel is, is something where you continue to see guys move around where they've gone from China, then into India, uh, Pakistan, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, in terms of you know places to find a, a cheaper place of manufacturing. So apparel has may remain relatively stable. The bigger issues that we continue to see is not only on the uh, the shelter side, but also the medical care services, and those moves just inherently higher. The problem that we want to talk about briefly is that shift in food. You know, you can see how food has been relatively stable, and then it had a, a nice little increase. Uh, over the last, let's call it, you know, three months. And and that is going to be a concern going forward because we continue to see issues on the food side. We continue to see food inflation. And it's just when we look at pricing, those are things that are going to be headwinds, especially when we consider, well, if people have experienced either a cut to their income, no income, you know, these are price sensitivities that are going to come back into the market. And when you look at just gasoline, this is some of the key reasons why we keep talking about. No, cheap oil is actually a good thing when you consider diesel prices and gasoline prices, because we, we want to give some benefit back to the consumer so that they don't feel those that pain. But again, it's it's this, this move in the medical care service, as well as food, that is something to watch because it's going to continue to kind of weigh on where things are going. And then obviously rent is going to be, you know, well, where is your rent going? You know, rent has obviously gotten a little bit cheaper depending on where you are. But if you're moving into a home, you know, your mortgage, what does your mortgage look like? So these are things to consider because we have to take the weighted average to appreciate, you know, where things are going. But between school and uh, and healthcare, you know, there's a bit more inflation in the market than, than is uh, first meets the eye. Now, when we look at the health of some of these companies, when we when we talk about some of these loans, you know, the CNI loans is a good way to to, to kind of take take a uh, a bellwether of all right. Well, what's going to happen to those large and small firms when you start to see write downs and charge offs, and the write downs and charge offs have increased exponentially. And as those increase, typically those charge off rates increase, and that's going to tighten the willingness of these banks to lend because they have to be a bit more conservative when they consider about okay, what does my balance sheet look like? How much? How, how much money do I have available 
And this is why we continue to, to see this way on, uh, on some of these banking earnings. And again, coming to the velocity of money, how quickly can you move this money through the market if you have to hoard cash on the bank balance sheet to solidify for bad debt, uh, bad debt expense and, and what's happening with some of these charge-offs. And again, the standards are, are continuing to tighten, which is going to make it difficult for a corporation to get a loan, a corporation to increase CapEx, and again, coming full circle back to hiring and increasing that manufacturing throughput, which is why we, we see that kind of unweighted move between large firms, small firms. Large firms might have a stronger balance sheet, more collateral, where small firms don't, again, uh, creating this kind of this backdrop. Now, taking some of those those issues from the corporate level and shifting it now down to the consumer level, we're starting to see credit card limits get cut, especially for the risk, riskiest borrowers. So on a total level, it, it's not a huge move, but we want to go and break things down in terms of 760 and above, most likely fine, not going to see much issue. It's the subprime, near prime that you're seeing a big cut. And these are people that, re, that uh, rely more on credit card, especially some of these limits, in order to go through their everyday uh, life. And then they, they you know, hopefully pay it off or at least you know, borrow against it as their uh, paychecks come through. Again, this is kind of where we're seeing some of this weight. Now, this, this chart makes it look a little bit scarier. So we wanted to say, okay, well, what does this look like versus some of those previous periods? And here's where overall credit card lines dropped slightly in the second quarter. And you have to understand it. So, okay, well, you can clearly see that the drop was, was there. It just wasn't a huge amount given the amount of credit card lines that remain in the market. And this is this is a difference. So it, again, it's unweight. We have to wait. Kind of where are we seeing these drops? You know, someone who has a very low credit score may not even have a credit card. So that's why the amount. If we think about those subprime uh, bank uh, credit card holders, you know, they're not going to see. It's just a smaller percentage, which is why some of this chart doesn't look as scary as the previous one, because you it's, it's you still have a lot of credit lines out there. You still have people who are taking advantage of these credit lines. But when you think about people taking advantage of the credit lines, well, what is the rate? And here you can see credit card interest rates are near all-time highs, or at least the highest levels in decades. And, and this is a problem because, okay, I may not cut your line of credit, but I'm going to charge you to use it. And that is where you can start to see some of that weight where it's like, okay, well, I have a credit card. I have a decent credit score. So I may fall within that, the view of prime plus, you know, you know, super prime. So, but instead of getting charged, you know, let's call it 13%, I'm now at 18%. That just means my cost of borrowing has gone up. And if you think about the spread in which you know, the Fed has put things, uh, essentially rates next to zero. They continue to purchase uh, MBS. You know, if you look at mortgage-backed securities, they're back to over uh, purchasing a trillion. You continue to see expansion of some of these uh, balance sheets, but yet credit card, you know, interest rates are near all-time highs. And and this is going to be a problem because, you know, obviously the, someone's making money because um, you're, you're lending at these rates. And this is something to watch as we go forward, if people, you know, remain concerned about their, their, uh, their jobs, their income, they're going to start to pull back because they just can't handle this kind of borrow it, borrowing or at these kind of rates, or they've already borrowed at these levels because they felt that they were going to get back to work and now they're not. Now they're going to have to cut back further in order to pay down some of this debt. And that's where we start to look at the growing share of unemployed struggling to pay bills. This is going to, you know, again, factoring back into what are people able to accomplish? And you, and the reason why this is an interesting chart is because you were looking at July with the, right before the unemployment benefits or the extended unemployment benefits expired. You can see the shift between July and into August and how, you know, 50%, it went from 27%, uh, you know, no, I cannot pay for my basic expenses to 50% saying, no, I cannot pay. And that is where you're starting to see that weight. That's where 
some of these issues are going to continue into, you know, not only August, but through September, as there isn't that fiscal stimulus, you know, the Democrats and and, uh, and Republicans remain at a crossroads. And realistically, none of them are, are really willing to make a decision, as it seems, before the presidential election, which is going to be a problem for the everyday consumer, which again, bleeds through the rest of the economy. And that's when we start to just go a little bit deeper in terms of this, the different sectors that have been hit the hardest and just change in posting trends and what, what's actually been happening at the job level, going back to ADP, you know, the unemployment numbers tomorrow. And you can see the decline similar are, is what you can kind of expect in terms of child care, food prep and other, but the larger than average declines is going to be the problem because a lot of these specific areas is where you get a lot of higher salaries, you know, people that have better benefits, people that may be more middle to upper middle class, which is going to be a problem, including banking and finance. Now, as someone who born and raised in New York, worked in Manhattan for for over a decade, I can attest to the fact that, you know, this is not new. I mean, this started in January uh, in uh, during the, the financial crisis and has only gotten worse over time. So to see the acceleration down, especially now that you have companies that are moving out of New York, trying to save money, you know, moving you know, different credit card services, operations and other into other areas, this is only going to continue, which is going to be an inherent problem especially given like software development, it's something where it's like, okay, well, maybe that software developer, you know, I'm going to, again, cut CapEx. Maybe I don't need that software right now, or I'm going to, you know, furlough that project or delay the project overall. And that's where you're starting to see some of these consultants and some of these different individuals, you know, fall off, which again is typically a higher paying job, which is why we continue to see some of this pressure overall. And something that shouldn't be surprising is driving, loading, and stocking has done fairly well. And again, we've talked about the increase in um, uh, in trucking. We've seen the increase in terms of just loading and, and getting things back through in the supply chain. So that's not surprising. The question is going to be, those aren't really high paying jobs. And if they are, they're, they're not as common. And that's where we, we start to get some of these longer term concerns on just that inherent purchasing. And this kind of just rounds it out in terms of largest declines in job postings on a metro level. And you continue to see a lot of these drops as people really move coming you know, back to the comment about uh, financial firms moving out of New York City or out of major cities and into some of the uh, ancillary areas, that is a trend that is going to continue. And again, it's leading to home purchases. It's leading to new home uh, permits, buildings, which is great to see. But again, it's still going to you know, create a situation where if I'm working from home, do I get a pay cut? Do, you know, does I, do I get a shift in the way I'm, I'm employed? And these are things that are going to be interesting that we're always going to look at. Now, uh, later on, Either this week, it was getting a little late, so maybe next week we're going to go much deeper into the inflation question and really look at the U.S. dollar as a, uh, a reserve currency. You know, what does it look like as the dollar weakens? What has been the new policy with the Fed and how has that impacted things going forward? And those are key um, questions that we want to ask and really kind of evaluate to understand what's, what's going to happen uh, going forward. Uh, so coming up uh, later this week, we're going to have an OPEC update looking at just a little bit supply demand. And then obviously our favorite, the primary vision frack spread count, which will be a nice short uh, show on Friday to so everybody can get some great information prior to heading into their uh, extended weekend. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.